Welcome to this very interesting panel on Latin America, a region that seems to be sometimes a bit invisible. I'm not sure why. I hope we can discuss about it right now. My name is Carolina Chimoy. I'm a journalist. I'm a correspondent for DW, Deutsche Welle, that's Germany's international broadcaster. I'm based in Washington, D.C. And it's a pleasure to be here in India and to be sitting here in this panel with this distinguished round that I will present you. So we have been talking a lot about uh, the current uh, situation in the world. Uh, we have a, a war going on in um, Europe and uh, the new global order is being decided in this moment, in the summits we are having, but also in the next years. And some countries would like to see a global order like it used to be before the war started in Ukraine, but some others um, are seeing this as an opportunity, right, uh, to reposition themselves. Um, the question is, where is Latin America in this um, struggle to find a new position in the new world order? Where are we going to see Latin America in the next decade? That is what I would like to discuss with you. And uh, Secretary Ebrard, if we could start with you. Mexico is one of the biggest countries in Latin America. Um, it's a very important country also because it's very close to the United States. Where do you see Mexico in the current situation? Is it unconditionally supporting the West uh, or is it finding its own path? As you mentioned, we have a, a very important commercial relation with the United States, but we promote and we have our own voice in the global affairs. Uh, this has been the Mexican tradition and today is a top priority for us. So one thing is the economic uh, integration and the other one is your political position in the world. And we believe firmly in the Latin American and Caribbean unity in several aspects and several issues, more now than ever because of the region's reorganization of the world. So, um, for instance, we have uh, we had the experience now or recently the pandemic. If we don't organize ourselves, a quick response with the capacity to produce vaccines, mm. you can see a, a, a really a disaster for us, because nobody care about what's going on with Latin America if we don't have enough capacity to prevent and react to several risks. Just for mention this one, which has been mm. just two year, years ago. So we have a, a, a self-sufficiency uh, sanitary plan. Mm. So uh, this is a way to prepare Latin American and Caribbean countries regarding the next pandemic, maybe in the next 10 years or, or even less. Yeah. This is a lesson, the main lesson from the pandemic is as far as you can be united, coordinate your efforts, mm. cooperate between you, between the, the countries in Latin America and Caribbean Basin, you are going to be succeed. Yes. All the um, way, no. Secretary Brad, that is the never ending story of Latin America, right? Unity, are they going to achieve that? And we have uh, here, uh, very distinguished guests representing uh, the region. Um, Minister Vieira, do you think unity is possible in Latin America in order to have a solid position in the global order and the new global order? Yes, no doubt. I thank you for your question. I think that Latin America has already shown improved unity in so many different occasions and so many different uh, questions. I totally agree with Marcelo. I believe that uh, unity is important in moment of crisis and it was the case during the, the pandemic. And uh, besides, uh, besides unity, I think we have also to promote everyday multilateralism. It's very important for our region. We have to be active in multilateral fora. It's a principle, uh, the defense of multilateralism is a principle that is enshrined in our constitution. 
I mean, it's one of the 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 main uh, principles that orient foreign policy. So unity and multilateralism, this is our strength. Latin America, though, has different governments. Um, the title of the panel where we're sitting today is the rhythm of the left. How can different governments be united? Is that still possible, even though they are from different sides? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, it's for Minister Vieira. It was just a follow-up question. Well, yes, I have no doubt uh, we can be in, uh, united, even though uh, some of the countries have different political positions and ideologies or orientation. Because I think that it's the, the main goal of every and any government is to defend the national interests. If you mm -hmm. defend your national interests, that's the, the position defended by President Lula. We talk and we speak and we discuss with every country because we are seeking the national interest. And the national interest, of course, we cannot forget that when we talk to our neighbors. We have two neighbors here. Uh, mm. One a direct neighbor with a, a big border line with Brazil, which is Uruguay, and Mexico, who is in the same region. We do not have a border, but we have a, a border in the sense of uh, uh, commonality of positions. Mexico has always been an uh, important uh, country in terms of non-alignment, as Brazil has had too, mm. the same position. Mm. I think there's, and, and by the way, we have very similar uh, presidents with very similar positions, so uh, it makes, of course, things easier. Vice Minister Alberto Ni Gomez, Uruguay is one of the smallest countries in South America, uh, but it's well known as a, a very solid democracy in the region. Um, and you're strengthening ties also with India. You just came from inaugurating the first uh, Chamber of Commerce, right, here Europe in India. India yes. where, where do you see, do you think um, the, if I may say so, uh, perhaps chaos we are in now, the storm. Um, is, is that an opportunity for Uruguay? Do you also think that Uruguay can reposition itself there? Okay, thank you, Carolina. First of all, you know, from a Uruguayan perspective, I would like to say that this context, international context, but also the regional context really, that for sure we are in a shift politically, maybe indeed that's the title, the original title of the conference. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you are part of a country that's the principle of dialogue, is a state and not just a government policy, you end up not being that concerned, you know, with this kind of shift that, that we live in the region. So this one chapter again in Latin America, but internationally, we are, as my colleagues just said, we are convinced that multilateralism, you know, in this context is the remedy. There is no other remedy, you know, in this context than multilateralism. Hmm. And our region has already a great platform for that. If we consider the regional initiatives we have already are 33 regional initiatives. We are for sure the most integrating region in the world. What is happening? That we have to transform this architecture in real you know, results. Mm -hmm. And I think the real results, not just going quantitative you know, and results or trade dynamics that we are always looking for, and of course it's very important for our countries. But given the uncertainty we have in the world, I think we have to work more on dialogue and working on a qualitative integration that unite us on the democratic and institutional values. And I think this will be um, the best way to use a platform we have already, that, as I mentioned, are 33 regional initiatives when we consider all the names, Mercosur, Aladi, mm. and all what you can put there. So we have to use them, again, not just quantitatively, but also qualitatively to, to have and would result in this international context. Because unity would make, of course, the region more attractive for other countries, like, for example, India, Secretary Kumar. Is that the case? Do you also think, are you missing a unity in Latin America to strengthen the ties with, with the region? Or, or do you think it's fine how it is like, now, like it is right now? Well, uh, how the countries of Latin America organize themselves, it's for the countries of Latin America to decide. But uh, you see, the point I would like to emphasize is that uh, in recent years, we are giving a lot of em emphasis and importance uh, to this part of the world. 
And uh, this is reflected in the increased engagement we have had. Uh, before coming here, we were just trying to see how many high level visits we have had to and fro. And uh, from India side at the president, vice president, we have had six visits starting from uh, 2014 when the present government came to power. And at the prime minister level, uh, four visits. Uh, return visits have been seven each at the level of president and vice president uh, from Latin America to India. And amongst these, you know, most of the countries, if not all, have been uh, covered. I think Indian business is showing particularly very keen interest in Latin America. This is not new, but something which is uh, building up. And which as, are the main sectors? So uh, if you look at sectors, IT is a very important sector. Uh, pharmaceuticals is another important uh, sector. Uh, fertilizers, chemicals is another, pesticides, because uh, a lot of the countries are, uh, you know, agricultural uh, producing countries, so uh, this is another area. Uh, uh, we, automobiles and two-wheelers, three-wheelers, uh, this is another segment. Hydrocarbons is something mm -hmm. where we have investments in countries like Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, and we are looking at the possibility of new investments in Guyana. Uh, the Guyanese president and vice yeah. president have visited India uh, this year itself, and we have had good discussions uh, uh, with them. And there are a host of other uh, sectors. Uh, ethanol, I think uh, we have an Indian company which is providing all across Latin America the machinery which is utilized for the manufacture of uh, mm. ethanol. Could, could so, you share with us a figure? How has it increased in the, in the last 10 years, perhaps? Uh, well, if you, if you go by trade figures, it is almost touching uh, 50 billion US dollars, uh, which is, if you look at what our ministers, the point which our minister tries to emphasize is that if you look at our relationship with our other major partners, may it be ASEAN, US, China, uh, the trade is around uh, 120 billion US dollars. So Latin America is not too far behind at uh, 50 billion US dollars. This is in absolute terms. If you look at the increase, I think it has been very, very significant in the last few years. Uh, touching, I think, uh, in certain cases, it varies country yeah, by country, course. but in certain cases, it, it has gone up even as high as a 60, 70 percent increase. 60, 70 percent, percent increase. increase in that is trade. impressive yeah. indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Aguero, Club de Madrid was created to promote uh, democracies around the world. Um, and this is, of course, also important because it makes the region more attractive uh, for investors and, and in the, in, on an international level. Um, where do you see Latin America now in this, in this um, function of Club de Madrid? Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, it's, it's important to, to realize that when the Club of Madrid was uh, created in, uh, or established in 2002, uh, many of us thought that democracies were on the rise, that democracies were going to multiply it like the fishes and the loaves. But we've seen over the years that that isn't the case mm -hmm. and that democracy is, and, and democracy itself is, uh, is under threat and uh, uh, such as multilateralism is under threat. And uh, these are two areas in which we have been working as an organization quite intensely uh, over the past years. Now, in this sense, and, and where does Latin America lie? I think that uh, in Latin America also, uh, it is important to, to realize that democrat democratic practice uh, is, is under threat. We have mm -hmm. had uh, elements like Elections, yes, elections have taken place. In fact, there were numerous elections even during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And yes, in many of those elections, we've, we have seen the shift, but it is important to, to realize that in some cases, institutions have been strengthened, but in others, unfortunately, this is not the case. And authoritarianism or populist governments, we have seen them in the past years. And we, have, we are concerned about 
the institutional strengthening of, uh, of democracy in the region no? and of democracies in the region. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that there are important shifts, certainly uh, in the case of Brazil, the, the, the recent elections have opened up in many ways a uh, hope uh, of, of a democratic recuperation uh, in, in the region. But then we have cases like Nicaragua, which unfortunately are, are quite dramatic in terms of the of the authoritarian turn that it is taking. Mm. And comparing it to the rest of the world, um, would you underline that Latin America still um, has a big amount of functioning democracies or wouldn't you really point that no, out? No, I think, yes, it, it, it does. It does and it is, it is in, in, in many ways a region that is continuously addressing that. It is a region though that has, uh, and, and we have to be very frank about this, it, it is a region that has serious challenges in terms of inequality and in terms of, of uh, growth. And those are two elements that do affect, uh, on the one hand, the delivery mm -hmm. uh, or, or our, our evidence of, of weaknesses in delivery uh, of, of democracies and of the democracies in the region. And we have seen protests, important protests in the, in the uh, past years, mainly associated to that. Mm. But it is, it is uh, or mainly as a result of, this, of these, uh, these two elements. But uh, yes, I think Latin America continues to be uh, concerned and working towards strengthening its institutions, its democratic institutions. Mm. Um, Minister Ebert, um, Elon Musk, as we know, is planning uh, to invest uh, a lot of money in northern Mexico, in uh, Monterrey. Uh, President López Obrador announced it on Tuesday. And also um, many um, manufacturers that used to work for U.S. companies in China have now shifted to Mexico. So do you think this new shifting in economics and in politics um, is a positive uh, movement for Mexico? Well, I think that it's a, <clears throat> obviously it's a great opportunity. Uh, we call it near shoring or friendly shoring. Uh, the recent announcement from Tesla uh, is the, is not the only one. We have recently BMWB from Munich. They are going to start to produce batteries in Mexico. Uh, so right now, near shoring. And uh, for us, a top priority in order to accelerate electromobility and the energetic transition of the country. Because everything is changing faster than planet. So we are going to have a short, shorter term than planet or expected in order to be uh, producing enough clean energy and um, Mm -hmm. to move the car industry to electromobility. We have mm -hmm. less time than planet or expected. So that's why we are moving fast in this regard. Uh, at the same time, I should say that o several Latin American countries has opportunities, similar opportunities uh, in, in different kind of fields at the same time, because we are leaving a great shift in, in the economic uh, supply chain mm. and, uh, and the economic organization, I should say, uh, right now in the world. Mm. So we have a lot of uh, possibilities. And um, India is also an interesting possibility for Mexico. You will open a consulate on Monday uh, here yep. in this country, right? Um, so how are these uh, relations with India changing or evolving? We are working very, very hard with, with several companies from India in uh, pharmaceuticals and medical, should, should say, medi new, new breakthroughs in medical science. And so I see that uh, in the next three, four or five years, the, we are going to see a, a really important increase in this kind of uh, uh, relationship between Mexico and India. It's growing very fast. Mm. Uh, it's based on trust and uh, a common agenda about not only the price of the medicines, which is a great issue in Latin America. Mm. Just to say, for inform the, the audience, 
<laughs> the difference in prices between uh, a pharmacy in one corner in Mexico and a pharmacy here in the corner for medicines, very, very common ones, is about 30, 35%. That's a, such an important difference. So you can imagine the meaning of that in terms of quality of life in our country. So we are talking about vision and policies that we share with India in order to improve the uh, conditions of the majority of the population. So we are going to, to see in the next years an increase in this kind of uh, initiatives with India. Mm. Um, Vice Minister Albertoni, is Uruguay also, because you just inaugurated the Chamber of Commerce, um, are you also looking in that direction or why was that important today for you to inaugurate the Chamber of Commerce? The first one, actually, right? Yes, yes. We are celebrating the 75th anniversary of our diplomatic relations. Indeed, with the Secretary on Monday, we want to have um, political consultation. So, so I think we are in a, in a great you know, moment in our bilateral relations. And Asia in general, you know, I think for, for our country is something that in general for Latin America is something that we know that we have to improve our, our trade ties mm. because it's a way to show that this regional integration that we're talking about is a platform, but not an anchor, you know, of our development. Um, and I think we see in India, given the, the, the values we share, democratic and institutional values, a great partner in Asia. So, so that's why, you know, in, term, in general, of course, Asia it's very relevant for us as a country, but specifically India is something we are putting more focus on. That's the reason why we have this new chamber of commerce between both countries. Mm. So that is the economic part, but then we have uh, geopolitics and the role that these emerging um, economies are, are having right now. Like for example, Brazil. Uh, Minister Vieira, you had a meeting uh, with Minister Lavrov um, here during the uh, Rising Attack and the G20, of course. Um, how is Brazil positioning itself as a possible mediator perhaps in the Ukraine conflict with Russia, or where do you see your country in that sense? Okay, well, by the way, uh, I had 20 bilateral meetings. Here in one during, week? Yeah, yes, in two days. So I met a lot of my colleagues, uh, ministers of other countries. And yes, we met uh, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia, with a country with which uh, we have very old and traditional relations. We have 195 years of uh, bilateral relations with resident ambassadors. And we'll be celebrating 200, two centuries in five years. So uh, we, uh, it's not myself, President Lula has said many times and repeated that he, he has heard so many mentions to war and arms and, and very little say about peace. He is calling for, he's not making any proposal or presenting any specific plan of peace. He's just calling the attention of people all over the world and countries that something has to be done, that we have to look for an, uh, an alternative, a way out of this crisis and he is ready to cooperate uh, with other countries, nobody can do that together, to generate some kind of uh, momentum that would lead to later uh, negotiations. But that's uh, what we are looking at. We have also mm. excellent uh, relations with uh, Ukraine and bilateral trade, and we have a large di diaspora of Ukrainian mm. descendants in Brazil. So we keep talking and in contact with both countries. Well, China has a very specific proposal for peace. Is that an alternative for, for Brazil to work with? Of course, no doubt. We, we are ready to work uh, with all countries that have the same, uh, the same desire, the same wish to look towards uh, an issue, uh, to look to, towards an exit of the situation and to open a way for negotiation uh, with a view to peace in the future. We are ready. It's good that they have a plan. We have to examine. I haven't seen it in, in details, but I think that they have to be uh, uh, examined by both sides and start a conversation after mm -hmm. that. 
talking about China, the Chinese influence in Latin America is also uh, quite uh, big, especially during the last decade. Um, do you, Ms. Huerdo, see a, a risk in that or do you think it's a positive uh, development? Well, I think that it's, it's uh, important to, number one, maintain dialogue and to have uh, as open as possible uh, a, a conversation, a dialogue to understand to understand the, the needs of mm. both regions, the needs in this case of, of, of China and the region of Latin America. And uh, I wouldn't say that I, that I see it as a risk, I see it as a reality. And it is something that, that is happening, the level of, of investment and the presence is, is, uh, is big, it's important. And it's it, to be able to understand it and to be able to manage it is, uh, is, is very, very important in, for all of the, the countries and for the region. Mm. Secretary Kumar, is that something uh, that would uh, worry India, the, the strong presence of uh, China in the region, or is that just not important for the steps you're planning to do in Latin America? Well, uh, again, I think I would repeat what I said uh, uh, in my earlier response. It is really for the countries of the Latin America to decide and choose on their partners. And of course, I'm confident that while doing that, they would make assessments uh, uh, which serve their national interest and take into account uh, some of the realities which we are seeing now uh, around the globe and the risks uh, which over-dependence has, uh, over-dependence on particular countries have uh, created, I think the minister was mentioning about, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, friend shoring and uh, uh, shorter supply chains. So these are the consequence of realizations which uh, different countries have uh, had as a result of our experience in the last uh, uh, two or three uh, years. But uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, we would like to see and we are happy that uh, things are moving in the direction of greater engagement, economic and commercial engagement, which India is having with uh, Latin American countries. And we would like to see that uh, deepen further and uh, getting more broad based. Which are your most important uh, countries in Latin America? For the corporation? Oh, uh, uh, in terms of trade, I think Brazil is the largest uh, trading partner. Mexico uh, is a close uh, second. We import uh, crude from uh, Mexico. Uh, we are buying a lot of uh, cooking oil, as I told you, from uh, Brazil and uh, Argentina. Uh, we are looking at uh, 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 some critical minerals uh, from uh, the re uh, region which mm. help us in our e-mobility uh, program. Uh, Argentinians did an uh, important project in India which is uh, production of a radioisotope which is used for medical purpose. Mm. Uh, the plant was commissioned recently and would be inaugurated in a couple of uh, months time. So uh, over a period of time, what we are seeing is that uh, our relationship is getting strengthened and we would like to give further push uh, to that. And that is reflected amongst other things in uh, our articulations at senior levels and uh, the bilateral high level exchanges, which I mentioned to you which have picked up momentum. Would, would you say this, this um, growth, do, would you say that has been changed um, since the war in Ukraine started, like on an economic level? For example, talking about cooking oil, did you? Yes, I, I, I gave you that example. You know, we were buying a lot of sunflower oil from Ukraine. And because of a disruption in that trade, uh, we are uh, picking up a lot of soya oil from Argentina and Brazil. And that is one of the reasons why our trade figures have jun jumped up as significantly as I, I, I mentioned to you. So, so yes, I think the war has had its uh, consequences. Uh, and uh, one of them is that we are looking at Latin America for some of the trade uh, lines which got disrupted. As a lighthouse. 
<laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> okay, um, I will have to close the round so that we can take at least one or two questions from the audience. Um, but before that, I would indeed like to know um, from you, uh, Secretary Ebrard, and from you, Minister Vieira, and uh, from you, Vice Minister, if you see your countries as a lighthouse and why, in one sentence, please, because otherwise we're not going to have the time. I am very, very, very optimistic about the possibilities of the Latin American uh, reaction and, and actions in several issues. It's not a sentence, but let me say <laughs> that why, I, why I am optimistic about this very short uh, remark. For instance, right now we are organizing uh, President Lula, President López Obrador, President Fernández, a meeting, some meeting uh, the next 5 of April in order to share uh, products in order to, to reduce inflation. Mm. So uh, Brazil with a list, Argentina other lists, Mexico other lists, Colombia maybe another one, several countries, in order to immediately open the door to this commerce which can help us to reduce inflation alimentary uh, mainly. And Argentina is also Argentina, in. Mexico, Brazil, Germany. Colombia, maybe other countries, okay. Cuba, no countries, I don't know. So building a lighthouse. In the short indeed. term, against okay. inflation. That's why I am so optimistic. Minister uh, Vieira, yeah, you're optimistic uh, as well? You see yes, Brazil I, as a I lighthouse? Am, I am optimistic for the same reason. It's, as I said, uh, unity, multilateralism, cooperation, and brotherhood, because we are very similar countries in so many ways. Sometimes we are not that close, like Mexico, but uh, uh, we feel and we behave the same way. So I think we have this very good opportunity, and it's true we can be, all of us, the, the whole continent can be a lighthouse. One phrase, indeed, you know, from a, from a Uruguayan perspective, I think that coming from a small country, economically, but a strong political country in the region, and you just said that. If there is one single message that I want to give, and given this international context, is that the, the condiment we, com we can put in this integration and friendship we already have is to know that development right now in this international context is not just a matter of an economic dimension, it's getting more and more a matter of a political dimension. Sometimes we said, you know, in Uruguay that more than currencies we need values, you know, and we need to promote that values. And mm -hmm. again, given the uncertainty we live, bolstering our institutional democratic values, I think is a good thing. To, and, and also from a Uruguayan perspective, we think it has been a very good rule, you know, for the development we achieve, even being a, a small economy. Mm -hmm. And the last word goes for Ms. Guero. Uh, Do you see a lighthouse in Latin America and why? I definitely do, and I think can, uh, I do because there is energy, there is a willingness to, as as uh, as we heard from from the ministers, uh, there is a there is a willingness to collaborate, to work together, and to find that unity that uh, yes, we have been seeking and and we have had at certain moments, but that that will make us uh, make the region stronger. Uh, very definitely. And I think that mm. uh, also the willingness and the engagement of the countries in terms of the social development agenda, and I'd like to add that element, mm. Vice Minister, the social development agenda to what you were saying before is, uh, is very, very important. Thank you so much. And I would like to open the floor for questions. I have a question that is mainly for the uh, Latin American uh, authorities, but I think all the panelists could uh, uh, answer that. Um, I was wondering uh, how the panelists have been engaging um, on the preservation of regional public goods and how they are uh, enforcing this dialogue, all, all they mentioned uh, at some point that the region has, I, I think. Um, we, uh, during COVID, uh, have experiencing a shrinking of uh, multilateral spaces and a shrinking on, of dialogue. Uh, we lost UNASUR, for example. And so how uh, you are working to uh, um, uh, engage on this dialogue and on preserving uh, public goods just like our, our people's health? Would you like to address it? 
goods, by the way, sorry, regional public goods, what do you, in general, like um, trade -off? Mainly, mainly health, thinking about COVID-19, but uh, I think we need to start this, this dialogue because we are now starting to discuss how we, we are doing mitigation and adaptation for uh, climate change, for example, and we could, should consider climate yes. a public good so as well. I have a quick response on that. I think COVID was a good example of how much we can work together. We, we didn't have, mm. a, as Marcelo just said, a, a regional response on that, you know, and I think was, and, and for sure, given, you know, the, the numbers and the, we could have a, another pandemic in the future, and I think we really have to change our way of, our trade platform, and if we want to be this part of French showing dynamics, we have to become friend of the rest of the world, mm. and even become friend of each other. Intra trade, right now in Latin America, is fifteen percent. So if we compare with other regions, you know, mm. if it's very low, so it doesn't. It's it's a very like um, difference between the the regional and integration we have with the trade and intra trade dynamics. And I think health it's a, it's a way to show that we didn't have a regional response, even though we have very good and, and a good regional platform, but we didn't have that conversation in any way. And Secretary, about you. Just, just to add uh, two things. In the recent past, the combination of Mexico, Argentina, AstraZeneca, so we produced more, well, enough vaccines for 17 countries. All the way, we didn't have any other option. Uh, uh, now, it's, uh, we are working with 10 regulatory agencies in order to create the Latin American regulatory agency because we have different kind of regulations. So we are unifying this. This is going to be a very important step in order to give public goods for our people. We are in this right now. Ministers Ebrard and uh, Vieira, I wanted to ask you about the title of the panel, which was The Rhythm of the Left. And we haven't talked much about that rhythm. And uh, I'm just curious what the rest of the world can learn about the rhythm of the left in Latin America. And especially if you could comment also on the differences or similarities how the left engages with the military in your respective countries and what we can learn from that. If I may add something to that, we had a previous discussion about the title and um, some of the members were not really, um, wouldn't say that it's a rhythm of the left because there are different shades, but thank you so much for mentioning that. I, I should have mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, please, Minister. Well, okay, thank you. Well, the, the, it, it's, the title is a reference, of course, to the shift in power after the elections and so many countries in the region, especially in our country, in Brazil, it was a, a very big shift uh, after the elections that took place in October. And, but as I said, repeat, repeating what I said before, uh, in terms of policy and foreign relations with the region, it makes no difference uh, what's the position or the ideology of the country. We, Brazil has 10 neighbors and we have to keep and maintain very good relations in the name of our national interests with our neighbors. We have 10 neighbors, including one European country that has a very long, France has a very long borderline, it's the longest borderline of uh, France, is with Brazil. So we have to talk with all countries, France and all other, the other nine uh, South American countries, and to discuss issues of great importance, like the, the, the environment, the, the Amazon forests, and so many others. And as it was said before, we have many mechanisms in the, in the region to deal with these questions. So uh, we are immune to these shifts in ideology. If, when and if they happen, uh, we have uh, instruments to continue to talk through uh, our regional institutions. Yes, definitely different shades also on that. Um, so precisely about this shift towards the left, um, there is a political scientist named Andres Malamud who pointed out that of the last 11 elections, 
Six were won by the left, but 10 were won by the opposition party. So I wanted to ask, in fact, how much are we seeing a shift to the left um, and how much is it actually a vote for change? Thank you very much. Who do you address your question? Uh, Mrs. Aguero. Uh, yes, those are, those are the facts and that is a, we have to think what caused that, not just whether it's to the left or to the right, but to the opposition, as you, as you pointed out. And that very clearly is a result of the very, very deep discontent and dissatisfaction that there is, among other things, for the two characteristics that I mentioned earlier, the inequality and the, and the, 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 the lack of economic growth. And we've got to also understand that the pandemic uh, had an impact, as, as uh, the minister and the vice minister were saying, their, their, their response perhaps wasn't fast enough, the delivery. And, and democracy is all about delivering well and delivering, among other things, uh, on that social development agenda. And so I would say, I, I would agree with Andres Malamud in that sense and, and say that it is the, the, the shift to the opposition and, and, and when there is discontent, in many ways, it's a, it's a natural human reaction. And, and, uh, and, fortunate, and fortunately, there were elections so that people mm -hmm. could express themselves in the ballot box and not necessarily through demonstrations or protests, of which we had quite a few since 2019, 2018. Thank you so much for this distinguished run, for this nice discussion. Um, I hope you're more interested in Latin America than before once you get out of this door. Mm -hmm.